Hello everyone, I wanted to shoot a video uh, talking a little bit about my Jeep Grand Cherokee. I recently changed the fuel pump in it. It did fix the problem that I have. It was a hard start problem. Um, I'm going to kind of talk you through some of the uh, some of the uh, diagnostics that I did, um, kind of how I came to the conclusion that it was a fuel pump. And then there weren't any videos out there when I was re first researching how to do the fuel pump. So unfortunately I didn't get a, uh, any footage of me actually changing the fuel pump, but I can tell you all the steps and uh, try to show you as much as possible and walk you through uh, what it was involved in actually changing the fuel pump. This is a 2016 Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's a 3.6 Pentastar V6. Um, and it is a two-wheel drive, although I think the directions, the steps are probably the same for a four-wheel drive. I don't think the uh, four-wheel drive drive shafts would uh, be in the way, but I also, I don't know because this isn't a four-wheel drive. Maybe there's some more skid plates on a four-wheel drive one uh, to remove, but all that aside, it should be pretty similar steps. I believe 2011 and up, uh, up until the style change, I think, that came, came along this year on the uh, new uh, redesigned Grand Cherokees. I can't speak for those because I don't know what they are. So the problems that we were having, my wife calls me and says, hey, my Jeep almost didn't start. Um, this has the push button start, it's proximity, so you pretty much get in the car, uh, put your foot on the brake pedal and hit that start button and it cranks right up. And she said it went through an entire cycle and it didn't start. And she was kind of worried, she pushed it again and then it did start. And so my mind first immediately went to battery. This is a five-year-old going on six-year-old vehicle now. Uh, it still has its factory battery. It's an AGM battery, which they're supposed to last a little bit longer, and they're kind of expensive to replace. But, um, you know, batteries don't last forever. It's a maintenance item. So I first said, yeah, I know what it is. It's your battery. Just come on home if it started, uh, and I'll put a new battery in it. So she gets home. I, I just... I mean, the battery is under the passenger seat. I roll it forward, pull it up, and go to pull the battery out, and I stick my little 100-amp uh, load tester on it, and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it at all. And I said, well, sometimes those lead batteries, what they can do is they can slowly lose their power over time. And so I said, let's just leave it you know, leave it sitting here for a couple of days. We have another vehicle that she drove the next couple of days. Um, let's leave it for a few days and then I'll load test it again a few days later. Did the same thing. It's still in perfect condition. I was kind of surprised. And so I was thinking, well, maybe I should just replace it anyway. And I was like, well, after I realized it was probably, I think it's $200 for the main battery and there's an auxiliary battery in here, which is another $100. So $300 to change the batteries. I was like, They're, they don't seem like that's the problem. I don't want to just start throwing parts of this thing to try to fix it. So Anyway, um, the vehicle always started. Um, it just was. It was. And it, and it had. It was always when it had been sitting for a little while. If you got in this thing, drove it to uh, Target or something, went shopping, came back, it would always start just fine and come back home. It was when she would work all day. You know, she would get to work in the morning. When she would leave after work, it would crank and crank and crank and crank and crank and then finally start. Um, I kind of thought about it a little bit longer, and then it hit me. I said, you know what? I wonder if you're losing fuel pressure. Um, because after sitting for a while, if you go to, you know, if it's slowly losing pressure, then when you hit that brake and hit that start, it immediately starts cranking. It's not like the olden days where you'd turn your key to run and wait a few seconds and then click it over to start. It goes run start immediately. So I told her, I said, well, for the next week, don't start your car using that push button. Use the remote start. It does have a remote start. Because I noticed when you do remote start, you can hear it prime the fuel pump for a few seconds, maybe five seconds or so, before the vehicle actually starts. I'm assuming when you do a remote start, it's firing up the computers and running a, you know, some kind of a quick check to see if everything's good um, before it actually tries to start. Every single time we remote started, it started immediately, you know, using the remote start sequence. So that kind of told me, okay, that's that's definitely it's losing fuel pressure somewhere. I kind of, you know, glanced over everything. We park in a garage. We never smelt gas, so it had to have been some kind of an internal uh, leak or, or fuel pressure problem. And so it kind of just led me to the fuel pump. I was like, that's got to be. I can't think of anything else that it, it would be. Maybe a week or two after she started having these slow start problems, the auto start light came on, the auto stop start uh, error. Um, and it said survey. I really wish it put some kind of code or just a phrase of why the auto stop doesn't work because there's like a hundred and something reasons why auto stop uh, start would, would stop. Um, all it had to do was say fuel pressure loss or not enough fuel. I'm, I'm sure that's what it was doing was it was detecting that the fuel pump was losing pressure or possibly not providing enough pressure. 
And so it knew that it was a risk to auto stop you because it has to be able to crank up immediately when you take your foot off that brake pedal. And if it had to crank and crank and crank and crank before it would start, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So that's my assumption. Um, and by the way, after we fixed the fuel pump, the auto stop was still on for probably about two days and then it went off on its own. So that was really exciting. I was afraid I'd, ha I'd have to get the uh, dealer to reset it. Not that I even use the feature. We always turn the feature off when we get in the car anyway because we hate it. But um, I hate seeing warning lights on my dash. I don't know. I'm weird like that. Um, even if it's a feature I don't care about. I, when there's warning lights on your dash, the problem is when there's actually a problem, you miss it because you start ignoring the warning signs. So I always have to fix that stuff even if it's something I don't care about. Anyway, so now on to the fuel pump. Uh, I'm going to go over a quick checklist of all that's involved because like I said, I couldn't find any information out there. I ended up buying a Haynes manual. I'd recommend getting one. They do make one for this model Jeep. Um, just to kind of help you out with some of the details. But um, here's the steps that I took. The first step, you want to uh, kill all the pressure to your fuel pump. And to do that, you pull a fuse um, and then attempt to start the vehicle. It'll kind of stutter a little bit. And then that removes enough pressure. There's still going to be fuel in the system, but it's not going to come blasting out at you whenever you open the system up. It's just going to dribble out, and that's something you can catch with a, with a shop rag. Um, you want to disconnect the negative terminal on the battery. I, I'll... It, don't do as I do. I never do that. If it's not something electrical that I'm working on, I never disconnect that. But you should. The you know that's a safety thing, right? You're dealing with gasoline. You don't want to spark. But I don't know what would be sparking when you're on your gasoline. I probably have way more spark risks risks inside this shop than I do uh, inside that vehicle. But regardless, so here's the annoying part. You get, then have to get underneath. You have to remove the skid plate. Uh, you have to remove the all the complete exhaust from the cat back. Luckily, it comes off as one complete unit, and it's not that bad, but it's still kind of crazy that you have to take so much stuff off. You have to remove the drive shaft because the fuel tank is on top of the drive shaft, and then you have to remove all the heat shields up underneath that are that are blocking um, that fuel tank uh, before you drop the fuel tank. And then there's uh, some straps you have to pull off. You want to make sure you disconnect everything around the fuel tank whenever you go to drop it. Support the fuel tank when you drop it. The fuel pump, so the other thing about this vehicle is it looks like it has two fuel pumps. It only has one. It's a saddle style fuel pump, which means, or a saddle style fuel tank, which means that there's fuel on the left and the right with a hump in the middle for that drive shaft. So once you're like at, you know, three quarters of a tank or something like that, now you've got two separate compartments. And, you know, as you're turning and stuff, the fuel's going to go one way or the other. Well, the fuel pump will also suck from the other side. There's some, they call it an auxiliary fuel pump, but it's not actually a pump. It's, it's more like just an, another cavity that can, that can collect the fuel. And the main fuel pump is pumping, and it's also sucking from that other side. Um, so don't be worried. I was When I pulled it out, I started freaking out because I'm like, I can't buy an auxiliary fuel pump, and I just did all this work. What if it's the auxiliary, and I go through, and I replace the main fuel pump, and the auxiliary's failed? Well, I, I took it off just to look at it, and I saw that it well, it's basically just a float and, some like I said, something to capture the fuel so that the, the fuel pump can suck it from. Uh, I recommend getting the tool... Uh, if you're going to do this job, um, to take, it's it's different. This isn't, I've done like uh, GMs before where there's like a, a tool that you're supposed to use. The Chrysler one, it's not just two sides, it's like three. Um, I'll put a link to the one that I used. Um, it wasn't like a fantastic tool, but it got the job done uh, and it was cheap. So um, it worked out for me. When I, I tried to just use a hammer and a screwdriver, which I don't think you should do because it's dangerous, but I tried it anyway at first, and um, I couldn't get, I could get the old one off, but I couldn't get the new one back on with that new gasket. It was just too heavy. There may be some other tricks you can use, but, you know, the, having the right tool for the right job uh, makes a big difference. So... Now I'm going to get under the vehicle and try to show you as much as I can. Oh, one other thing. The drive shaft, when you actually go to put that back on, those are 41 foot-pounds of torque if you've got a torque wrench. Okay, so the first step was removing the pressure from the fuel pump. Uh, for me, it was F70. Uh, this fuse right there, it's a 20-amp fuse in this back corner, um, but you can refer to the documentation there on your fuse block to handle it. Pull that out and then attempt to start the vehicle. It'll kind of run and shudder and shudder and shudder. Uh, and then after, after a while, it'll just stop running uh, and that pulls all the pressure out of the fuel system. So the next thing, like I was saying, is uh, remove the negative terminal from the battery. Uh, the battery's under the passenger seat. I'm not going to show you that, but 
right there the third step is pull this filler tube off it's just a hose clamp so you just take a hose clamp off use some uh, screwdrivers or some uh, um, what are they called picks to reach in there and pull it off it is a little tight but you can get it just kind of wiggle it and get it get it loose one thing I forgot to mention just a second ago if you have the ability run as much fuel out of your tank as possible it'll make things so much easier i had probably less than a gallon in it so um the tank is not very heavy but every gallon of gas you have in there is another eight point what is it three four pounds um and that can get pretty dang heavy on a 30 plus gallon tank so um or not 30 sorry i think it's a 25 gallon tank anyway uh it's it's a pretty big tank so um drain as much of it out as you can um like i said ours was still working so i drove it uh, until the range said that it was low like it stopped giving me an estimate on how many miles i could go and then i went like another 15 miles just driving around the neighborhood um trying to burn as much fuel as possible so like i said i was down to about less than a gallon and that made it uh, actually possible to for one guy to do it himself Okay, so bear with me here. I don't know how this GoPro is going to work down this low on the ground, but right here is a skid plate, so I'm just a little bit away from that filler neck. Um, remove this. It's just a couple of bolts and, uh, and nuts. I think it's like 13 millimeter and 15 millimeter. I don't remember off the top of my head. I apologize for that. Um, you need to remove the exhaust, which is right here, this muffler. Um, now there are bolts. Uh, luckily, it's it's all stainless, which is one nice thing that Jeep does. Um, so they don't rust and become like impossible to remove. Now I'm not guaranteeing that's the case, but we I live in Texas where there's not a lot of salt on the roads too, which probably helps. But uh, anyway, there's four bolts here. Um, I can't remember if there were any more bolts. That may have been it, but there's an awful lot of these hangers and there is a trick to these hangers. Oh, actually these ones, I didn't even attempt to pull off. There is bolts. Um, sorry, you probably can't see it with the light. Maybe I need to go get a flashlight, but there's two bolts here on both sides. Um, so that I didn't have to mess with those hangers. And then let's go around to the back side. Do jack this thing up and put it on some jack stands. I did. It made it a lot easier cause you have a little bit room to work. There's a hanger right there. there. The trick to these hangers is get just a, a little bit of WD-40 and spray it inside there. It, it makes it so much uh, more possible for them to slide off. Now I did that and then I was like, okay, I'm solid. But then there's actually another hanger that you can't see uh, up here. It kind of sucks to get to. I scratched my uh, hand a little bit um, getting in out of there. Uh, it does, you can pull this thing off, just get a screwdriver, stick it here and pop it right off. And then that's an easier way to get in with your hand. Again, spray it with WD-40, reach in there and then just give it a nice firm tug uh, and wiggle a little bit and you'll get it to come off. Then slide that whole exhaust pipe out the back okay so next you want to remove the drive shaft let me get some light down here there you go the drive shaft they're hex bolts Ugh. and there was some kind of like thread locker some weird kind of thread locker on these things it was almost like it was silicone um, not that it was really hard to remove, but you couldn't just spin them with your finger. You had to use a wrench on the whole time. So this step took forever because there's, uh, what, eight, I think, bolts on the back and there's six on the front. Um, halfway up it. Mm, man, I'm getting too old for this. You got to remove this heat shield and then sharing those bolts. Um, there you go. Right there in the center of the screen. You got to remove that heat shield and then that that is a stud that goes to a support for the center of the drive shaft some kind of bearing of some sort that that middle drive shaft runs in um and then do the front one uh same thing it's the same size as the back one so it's flashlights it's puking out on me um once you get that drive shaft i used a wheel dolly because it is kind of heavy for one person to, to manhandle i set one half of it on a wheel dolly picked up the other half and just rolled it out from under the vehicle once that's out you got to get the um heat shields and so a lot of this stuff it's not it's not that difficult but you're working on your back and it's time consuming and that kind of sucks but um it's not really hard per se it's just a lot of little steps you want to pull the heat shields off um, some of the heat shields have these little uh, sn um, little quick connect plastic thingies. You just stick a trim removal tool, pop the inside out, and then pull it. The whole thing comes out pretty easily. 
um, and they go back on really easily too. I didn't break any of them working on this. Some of them, you can see that one right there, there's a bolt. Um, I'm sorry, like, it's not even a real nut. It's like, it's like a pressed piece of sheet metal I, with threads on it. It's kind of weird, but anyway, those just come right out fairly easily. Oh, there you remove all those. <clears throat> And then you want to remove your fuel tank. So let's come up here. Oh man, it's being covered up by, okay, so underneath this skid plate, there is a fuel line disconnect. You'll want to make sure you grab that one. And then back here in the back, you can see those ones. So there is, there's just one. That I think is the EVAP tube. So that goes from the tank um, you just have to remove it right there. And then all your harnesses are on the driver's side. I'm sorry, not driver's side. The passenger side. Uh, right there. The passenger side of the drive shaft. There's uh, a connector right there. And that was really hard to get to. Um, I think I used my trim removal tool to just pull it out of the frame. And then it, you just disconnect it. Um, I think that was it. But uh, don't quote me on that. There may have been another one. <laughs> um, I'll have to review the picture. I did take a picture of this thing. Upon reviewing my picture that I took, it looks like there's actually four spots you need to disconnect. So in the top right up by that wheel dolly is the electrical connector that I just reviewed. Um, it's just south of that, on which would be on the other side of that drive shaft, there's the EVAP tube. I, I guess, I don't know if there's two. I don't know if those are two EVAPs or what, a breather. Um, but yeah, there's two there. And then the other one is going to be on the driver's side front, and that's the fuel line that goes to the vehicle. There's six bolts that go to these straps that hold the fuel tank on. There's four straps, but two of the straps right here in the middle where they meet that shares the same bolt underneath that heat shield. <laughs> so I have a pair of Harbor Freight jack stands, and I know they've been recalled, I think. There's no model number on the ones I have because they're pretty old, so they probably need to be replaced. I don't hang out under them. I have a pair of uh, AC Delco jack stands that I normally use um, on vehicles, but I would say I don't trust the Harbor Freight jack stands uh, with a vehicle, but I trust them with an empty fuel tank. So I put those two jack stands underneath this vehicle. Um, or I'm sorry, underneath the fuel tank, and then I put my uh, normal pump jack under the other half of it. So that's how I was able to remove it. I just slowly lowered the jack. I looked up, made sure everything was disconnected, um, and then would just slowly lower those jack stands uh, until it was low enough that I could just set it down on that wheel dolly and roll it out onto the floor. Something else I was not aware of on this Jeep Grand Cherokee is you can put this thing in accessory and run and still not get this uh, shift lever to move. It's all electronic and it's just locked. So when you need to get to the top bolts on that drive shaft, you need to be able to rotate the drive shaft. You can't put the vehicle in neutral. Well, there is a hack. Um, you come under here. It off last time. I thought I just got it with my fingers. There you go. Okay, just get your finger in there and be aggressive with it. And then it's got this. This It was all like tied up. This is the first time I've ever used it since we bought the vehicle. Um, you have to pull this up. So in order to get this to pull up, you put a screwdriver in this little lock piece, unlock it, and it's actually a lot easier to do two-handed. <laughs> um, but you unlock it, pull it up, and then it'll latch itself up. Now the vehicle is in neutral. You've just overridden this. Um, it's now in neutral. So you can now rotate the drive shaft freely. Well, assuming the rear of the vehicle is on jack stands. And then to put it back, you pull up on it. I'm gonna try to do it one-handed to relieve the pressure, unlock, and then drop it down, click it back down. Now you're back in whatever your gear shifter selector is set to. Well guys, I really hope this video is helpful to somebody out there. I know it would have been better if I would have actually recorded me doing all the work, but uh, I didn't, I was kind of in a hurry to get it done and I didn't 
really know if it would fix the problem. I was pretty confident it would. Um, it turns out it did, so that's great. Uh, I wanted to kind of wait and make sure that it actually fixed the problem before deciding to do a video on the topic. So anyway, uh, hopefully that was helpful to somebody. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. You can subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos about just kind of the random stuff I do. Uh, this is one of my vehicles. I'm about to do the um, rear differential fluid, and I also want to do the transmission fluid in it. So uh, hopefully I get around to recording those uh, and you actually see what I do. Um, so hopefully that's helpful to somebody. Thanks for watching.